So I'll start off by saying I've, I've known George Rawson since the early 2000s and knew of his passion for Macintosh. During his time at the Glasgow School of Art, as a member of the library staff, he was instrumental in helping establish its archives. In 1996, he completed a PhD on Macintosh's mentor, Fran Newbury. He, was create, he has created two exhibitions on Newbury's work. In 2009, he contributed to a book and exhibition, The Flower and the Green Leaf on Glasgow School of Art in the time of Charles Ray Macintosh. George also produced a website in Macintosh's North Italian sketchbook and worked on sketchbooks produced by Macintosh in the British Isles in the collection of the Hunterian Art Gallery at the University of Glasgow. His interest in Italy goes back to 1960 when he first, first visited Rome and Venice. This evening's discussion is going to revolve around George's new book and various stages of Macintosh's study tour of Italy. George's son, Ashley Rawson, Rawson, who designed the book, is standing in for George this evening. Ashley's career was la largely been in the heritage sector where he studied. He was head of design at Glasgow Museums and more recently the head of content at the National Trust for Scotland. He left the trust this time last year. I was has been doing consultancy work like the book by George. Ashley is also a, a super keen self-taught artist and has had some success with paintings such as Glasgow Kiss and Nine Glasgow Kiss. He also designed and painted the first Hamden mural on Glasgow's south side. So I'm delighted to welcome Ashley, who's going to start off this evening's discussion by giving some background and elements and giving us a tour of Italy. But I'll hand you over now to Ashley. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Right, well, thank you, Stuart. And hello, everyone. Um, it's lovely to kind of see your names, if not your faces. Um, uh, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to share my screen uh, and we'll see if this works. And then I'm going to take you on a little tour of Italy, since none of us are allowed to, are allowed to travel at the moment. Um, so here goes. I wanted to start off by introducing uh, my dad, uh, who has obviously produced this book recently. You'll have heard what I just said about him, so it's a shame he can't be here tonight. Um, but I'll do my very best as a non-academic uh, to give you an impression of the book and sort of guide you through its content. Um, now, my dad spent most of his, or a lot of his working life um, as a librarian at the Glasgow School of Art. Um, some of uh, mine and my siblings' earliest memories uh, uh, relate to, certainly, um, I remember a time me and my sister went to the Glasgow School of Art to visit my dad at work. Uh, we went along these dark corridors and saw these fantastic sort of what I thought were statues, or I now know they were plaster casts. Um, we went along to this building, we met my dad uh, in this library. And obviously it's really, it's quite poignant now because uh, it no longer exists. Um, but here he is, I'm not sure the exact year of this picture, but the chap down in the right hand corner there, that's my dad. It's probably about 1983 or four or something like that. Um, now, um, as Stuart previously said, my dad's produced a number of books um, and contributed to a number of books. Um, so here's just some images of them. We've got the flower in the green leaf, green leaf. Uh, got Macintosh's masterwork, which he contributed, I think it was essays to. Um, we've also got, um, a, he really um, did a lot of work <laughs> looking at a chap called Charles Heath Wilson, um, who was a real sort of, um, a real innovator in art education in the mid 19th century. Um, he was really, really pivotal on, um, you know, basically developing um, art education. He also was probably best known for his involvement in uh, glazing, uh, helping to glaze Glasgow Cathedral. Now, some of these windows still remain, but a lot of them have gone, but it was a, it was a very, very big um, public art programme at the time. Um, my dad also um, uh, has written a few books about Fran Newbery. I'm sure everyone here's heard of Fran Newbery. Um, obviously, Fran Newbery was a, a really big influencer on uh, Macintosh and, and all his friends. Um, so that's, that's my dad's sort of previous work. Um, and moving on to the book we're going to talk about tonight, which is Charles Rennie, Charles Rennie Macintosh's Italy. At the time that Macintosh was 21, 22, um, 
the sort of legacy of Greek Thompson was massive in Glasgow, um, so much so that um, the very first, um, the, the reason behind his tour is that he entered a competition called the Alexander Thompson Travelling Scholarship. Um, and this was, a, a this was awarded to one student, essentially, I think it was annually. Um, um, and that student, you know, there's all these wonderful Victorian rules, uh, such as uh, he had to have, a, the, the, he or she had to have an approved moral character. Um, so the trustees there were, you know, judge wanted a fantastic young person to go out and do all sorts of stuff on a tour. Um, and in order to win this competition, um, all contestants were asked to design a public hall in the early classic style. So here's Charles Rennie Macintosh's entry. Uh, it doesn't bear too much resemblance to his later work, but this is what won in the competition. Um, and he won it by the skin of his teeth. Uh, I think it was by one vote. Uh, and there were quite a lot of trustees uh, all you know, making decisions on this. So he managed to just, just win this competition. Um, now, the prize for the, uh, for the competition was uh, fantastic. It was uh, 60 pounds um, and, uh, and essentially, which would pay for a, a tour of Italy. Um, but this wasn't a kind of uh, the sort of field trip that I would have gone on at university where there wasn't too much study and it was more about social stuff. Um, uh, what what we have noted is he was quite um, he, he there was you know he was quite under the cosh. Um, uh, firstly, he had to provide a very clear map of Italy or a, 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 an impression of exactly where he was going to go um, and, and what his plans were, uh, an itinerary, which had to then get approved by the trustees, um, and he also. Um, didn't get all of the money up front. I'm not sure if it was because they didn't trust the, the winners of these things, but they gave him 30 pounds in order to um, buy his tickets, travel, all that sort of thing. And the next 30 pounds of the 60 would be released um, to him, but only when uh, he had sent or, or shown the trustees all of the artwork, all of his studies, everything he'd done uh, while he was away. Um, and initially, um, uh, he, he went back to them and he said, do you know, I'd, I'd really like to, um, uh, you know, so the, the, the initial part of the trip is going to take three months, which is what was expected. But he had said to them that he would like to stay on for nine months and he'd asked if he could have the rest of the money while he was still in Italy. Uh, and they said only if he sent through all his, all his completed artwork. Um, so they came to a kind of agreement there at the start. Um, so off he went. Um, now, there's some quite peculiar things that my dad's um, pointed out here um, uh, you know, about, about the tour. Firstly, um, most most people who went on a grand tour or went to Italy um, would go um, across uh, France and Switzerland uh, on, and by train, essentially. Um, but Macintosh chose to go by boat. And this wonderful ship here, this is a picture of the ship that he went on, and it's called the SS Cusco. And um, it was built on the Clyde. Um, <laughs> it was quite a quite a posh ship, really, quite nice, you know. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to read you in a minute what it says about it. So this is the in, inside, and we were, me and Stuart were looking at this earlier on, and Stuart was commenting on the wonderful panelling and, you know, how, how lovely it looks. Um, so Macintosh obviously spent a bit of time on this boat. Um, my dad says in the book, you know, about how he, he ended up meeting a family that he became quite friendly with. And also he, he met quite a few, I think, friends, people he became friendly with who then uh, at times slightly distracted him initially when he got to Naples. Um, so yeah, this, this boat um, is, let me find it. Um, yeah, it was owned by the Orient Steam Navigation Company, Clyde Bill. Uh, the voyage took nine days. Um, and it was via uh, Plymouth and Gibraltar. Um, and it boasted, um, so this is what it said in the marketing materials, it had very high class cuisine, 
hot baths and even electric lighting. So it's very nice. Um, now, the first place he got to, and I think one, one thing to initially say is, um, if you look at this map, um, this is obviously a section of a map of Italy. Um, the full map of Italy is in the book, and I'll show you it later on. But this map is based on um, maps that my dad saw in the Bedecker guidebooks. Um, and Bedecker guidebooks were almost the Lonely Planet guidebook of their day. They were the thing that tourists would take with them. Um, they had all sorts of fantastic information in them about, obviously, you know, museums, the prices of things, what you'd expect to pay, all that sort of thing, good restaurants. So they were really, really um, thorough books uh, that were very useful. Um, and uh, so that's where this map derives from, from, from. And as you can see, the SS Cusco um, sails through the Straits of Gibraltar and gets to Naples. Um, now, in Part of the wonderful thing about my dad's book is the um, that you see the, these places through Macintosh's eyes, and you also, as you'll see later on, you also um, there's also a lot of wonderful photography that's contemporary to the time, so that you can actually see the sorts of scenes that he would have seen. Um, so, on approaching Na Na Naples, all seemed quite well. Um, but unfortunately, um, as soon as he gets there, um, and here's the Bay of Naples from the time, like I said, this is a contemporary image. If you look closely, you can see a, a bowl, not unlike the Cusco, just in the bay there. Now, so this is what Bedecker Guide said. Um, Bedecker Guide book informed Magnetosh that Naples, despite occupying one of the most beautiful situations in the world, was singularly deficient in objects of real artistic or architectural significance. I think that's probably quite harsh. Um, not sure, uh, but you know, I've never been to Naples, so I might hate it too. Um, my dad has been. Uh, I can't remember what he said though. <laughs> uh, and you would you would hope that that Bedecker prediction didn't actually echo through, um, but it all starts off really badly for Macintosh. Um, so, with permission to disembark, the passengers were taken to the Dagana, which is the customs house, uh, where their bags were examined. And the terrible thing that happens to Matt and Tosh is that his tobacco gets confiscated and he's unwilling to pay a 10 francs duty. So it doesn't start off that well. Um, now, however, he then, um, uh, he, he does then, you know, over the next few days, um, he starts to, uh, I think, get into things a bit. Um, for example, the, initially he does, he does a thing that I think most um, young people would do if they were given a load of money that they hadn't had before. And when you actually track this tour, what you see is what my dad's noted is that he um, starts off, you know, going on quite nice boats and uh, staying at sort of posh hotels because he's obviously burning through his cash. And uh, in, uh, in Naples, he stays at the Hotel de Vesuve, Vesuvius. Um, uh, uh, and not so long before he stayed there, um, um, people like Queen Sophia of Sweden uh, and Oscar Wilde himself uh, stayed there. So it's quite a, you know, quite a nice place to stay. And it was the most, I think it was the most expensive, like my dad said, it was one of the most expensive hotels in the city. Um, now, there was quite a lot of, um, as people say, uh, uh, I've heard uh, about Italy uh, today, there was back in the day, there was quite a lot of red tape um, uh, in terms of, Macintosh needing um, paperwork, things like that, to allow him to do the things he wanted to do. So the thing that, uh, the phrase that keeps on coming up in my dad's book is uh, that he had to keep on getting a thing called a permesso, um, uh, a permesso, sorry, um, which would allow him to sketch in different places. Um, and one of the big draws of Naples as today is that um, obviously you, a lot of people stay in Naples and visit the surrounding area, like, you know, go to, um, you know, Herculaneum and Pompeii. Um, these are the sorts of things that Macintosh did. Um, now, you see the picture. He also obviously wandered around Naples. He went to the Museo Nacional, which um, was the big uh, museum in Naples. Um, the thing that he noted about that was he said that there was probably more Pompeii in that museum than there actually was in Pompeii itself, um, which I thought was quite funny. Um, and, um, he also, in the evenings, he did things like, so he, he went on, um, he went to the opera, 
uh, with uh, one of the families that he met on the boat. Um, he also went to, and I don't know if you can cast your mind back to the start of this horrible time we're all going through, um, you know, with the the pandemic, but um, there were scenes of Italy uh, right at the start of the pandemic, and they were showing uh, these vast uh, malls um, that were, were empty, these beautiful sort of 19th century malls. And um, one of those um, that Macintosh was particularly impressed with, um, if I can find the name of it, um, no, no good. Uh, yeah, sorry. The Galerio Umberto Promo, which he, which had only been built the year before Macintosh went on his visit, and he was really blown away by this. He thought it was a really lovely piece of architecture. Um, now, the thing that I've pulled up here is because um, this this continues a kind of theme that runs really interestingly through my dad's book, and that is that my dad spots a lot of either parallels between um, architecture that we might know of uh, and architecture in Glasgow. So for example, this picture here that we have on the screen, um, where we have the Santa Maria del Carmen. I do, I do uh, apologize for all my pronunciations, I'm too Glaswegian probably. Um, but essentially my dad points out, you know, some of the things he chose to draw Maybe he chose to draw because they're very similar to some of the things he would have seen in Glasgow as well. So obviously you can see the similarity between this place and also St. Andrews in the Square there. Um, as he went on, um, and this is one of the fascinating things about this, because the, the, my dad uses the uh, Macintosh's diary from the time, and uh, you really get a sense of how grumpy and fed up about some things uh, Macintosh was. And he starts off not being particularly, I think, friendly towards some of the Italians he meets. So we've got uh, and, and some of the, his opinions. So he says, the streets are narrow, the people are lazy and filthy. In fact, everything seems to do its levelest to make the place disagreeable and increase the pesti pestilential smell which pervades the whole town. So, and uh, Stuart was joking earlier on, this wasn't me. Stuart was saying, um, yeah, well, this guy comes from the East End of Glasgow, you know, so what's he, you know, and, and I imagine that was when the East End wasn't like it is now, you know, like the Deniston becoming very nice, etc. So that's, I thought it was quite some quite interesting quotes there from Macintosh. Um, so he finishes up in Naples um, and he gets on another boat called the Leon, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And um, this is quite interesting because um, at this time, um, most, most people who went to Italy didn't actually go beyond the boot. You know, they, they didn't go to Sicily. Um, it, it wasn't a kind of done thing, really. And so Macintosh was, you know, my dad points out that Macintosh was one of the first sort of people to really do this on a kind of artistic tour and to really show interest uh, in Palermo. Um, and we... The, the, the interesting thing is here as well, uh, that by reading the accounts of Macintosh's continuing trip, um, he continues to have, I think, quite a, quite a rocky start to his, his tour. Um, uh, he, you know, on the Leon, he is very, very seasick. Um, uh, uh, hilariously, there's a, there's a quote in the book about how he's almost aghast that the, the boat is full of Italians, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which shouldn't have come as too much of a surprise to him, I don't think. Um, and, and, it, and it's kind of reminiscent of, uh, you know, some people who go abroad and then are then shocked that there aren't lots of nice um, British bars or whatever uh, nowadays. So, so he, yeah, it was, it was quite a, he didn't have a great trip. Um, when he got to Palermo, though, um, he really started producing um, uh, some, some lovely work. And, and the, the, the tour continues uh, in that vein. And, and as... Um, uh, I think by the time he is leaving Palermo, he's really starting to warm a bit more to um, both the Italian people. Um, he's starting to strike up conversations and trying to use combinations of French and English to communicate with people on the boat. Uh, and I think it's all starting to, you know, settling into it a bit more. So, um, I mean, over the next uh, few slides, I'm, I'm not going to continue uh, going into great, any, any great detail about the actual trip in each town. I'm just going to show you some of the lovely uh, contemporary images that we have in the book, and I'm also going to show you some of the artwork um, that he produced. So this is uh, Palermo Cathedral. Um, 
this is now let me look i have a book somewhere um uh, if you bear with me for two seconds uh, yeah so this is th this one on the left um is the is monreal cathedral um now one of again another one of my dad's interesting points uh, in this book is that because my dad has an and I probably haven't mentioned this, but my dad followed in Macintosh's footsteps. So he took the exact tour that Macintosh took um, with his fantastic traveling partner, my mom, uh, and they went round and they identified, so my dad identified all of the locations where Macintosh had done these drawings. Um, so it's a mixture of photography saying, here's what it looks like now, here's, here's what he drew. And by doing that, some of the amazing things that he discovered was that at this early stage, Macintosh was, a, he was a designer. He was not just, and he was, he was all about composition. He wasn't just painting or drawing exactly what he saw. In this case, in the left, um, when my dad went to look at this actual view, the view doesn't actually exist. So what Macintosh had done is he positioned the cloisters so that you could see this view through them. So he was already starting to play around with um, the sort of different elements and composing images in that way. Um, this next one on the right, um, that's the Campan Campanile La Martirana in Palermo. Again, sorry about my pronunciation. <laughs> um, uh, now here, um, I just thought I'd show you the whole map. So. Uh, this is the entire tour. Um, now, when you get the book, um, you'll see that what my dad's done is he's dated everything. So you can see the exact dates where, um, where Macintosh, uh, you know, what towns he was, he was visiting at what point. And you can go through that. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to continue going because we've only done the first two bits. Um, I'm just going to do a whistle stop tour. So Here's another contemporary image. Um, the important thing to say about these images is that um, although these aren't Macintosh's images, he didn't come home with a bundle of postcards um, that we know of, um, that, that we have then put in the book, but we know that all of the images in the book are contemporary postcard images to the time. So if you imagine Macintosh walking through Rome past I don't know, um, street stalls and things like that. These are the postcard images that he would have seen. Uh, and we've kept that true all the way through the book. So here's a lovely view of Rome. Um, so I think people, people who know more about this sort of thing than me will already know exactly what a lot of these images are. So this is, um, this is the Arch of Titus, um, which Macintosh did. Uh, so you can see he's really producing some really knockout, beautiful artwork. Um, his next stop was Orvieto, Siena and Florence. Again, an art contemporary image. Um, and there he produces these wonderful things, almost, almost showing more of an interest in the design side of things rather than necessarily the um, you know, painting, painting buildings. Um, so these are mosaic bands um, from Orvieto Cathedral. And this is, see, um, okay, yeah. So this is a glazed terracotta frieze from Bargello in Florence. Um, his next stop was Pisa to Ferrara. Um, and again, if you can hear me leafing through the book, my microphone's probably very loud. <laughs> um, um, so this is again, another mosaic frieze um, and this one's from Ravenna. Our next stop was Venice, some fantastic images there. Um, everyone knows what this one is, the Cadoro. Um, again, you know, when you look at the detail of it, he, he really focused on a lot of the small details there, really beautiful work. Um, next was Milan and Pavia. Um, now this one, um, it's quite hard to show in a way um, because this this one is actually a door, um, but um, we've kind of zoomed in on the details for you um, so that you can 
see that up close. Um, I'll just try and find the exact title of it. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, that's the um, Cartosa de Pavia. Uh, and that's a, a blind window in the west front. Um, now, a really, really interesting part of, of the book is that, you know, it's, it's a very, it's a really interesting sort of academic um, uh, approach that my dad's taken. So you, you get to see the tour through Macintosh's eyes, but my dad is also seeing it through his eyes and um, sort of looking and, and making, you know, drawing some conclusions and some observations from that. Um, and I think historically, uh, my dad says at the start of the book that, you know, there, there wasn't all, the, although his tour is well documented, one of the best documented parts of his life because he kept a diary and there's obviously lots of lovely artwork. Um, so in spite of that, it's never received too much attention because he was only 22 and it's almost, it has previously almost been thought that it didn't have such a massive influence on his later work. But in the later part of the book, my dad really draws out um, some conclusions which are really interesting and it's often by setting Macintosh designs uh, that you may know about and setting artwork from his sketchbooks alongside that. So I'll show you some of these. I'm not going to show you everything as I say it's a real treat for you to look through the book. Um, so this first one, um, so this is a design for a chapter house. Um, Macintosh did this pretty much soon, very soon after he actually returned from his tour. Um, again, it's not; it doesn't look particularly like the sort of Macintosh style. But the, the 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 interesting thing is is that he is taking elements from his books and he's applying them almost as a direct lift. So if you if you look at this and you look at the next image, um, here you basically see that essentially he's stolen Milan, um, Moses from the side of Milan Cathedral and he's put it in one of his designs and it's a, a direct lift, <laughs> as it were. You know, you can really see the detail that the tablet's in the same position, the arms and the robes are in the same position. So he's really using these reference materials that he's built up um, to, to help him, um, you know, pad out his designs. Um, this is a particularly interesting one. Um, you'll all recognize this building on the left. Um, so this is a bit, bit later on, you know, so this is obviously the lighthouse or the Glasgow Herald building. Um, now, uh, initially, when you look at that, you'll see they don't look anything like each other. But when you actually look at the detail, um, you will see um, that at the very bottom here, this area here, you'll see that there's a door which is identical to one of the doors that he drew um, when he was on his tour. So that is the doorway to the Santa Maria della Grazia in Milan. Uh, and he's, he's applied that here. Now, it's, it's important to see, so I've done a zoomed in version as well, it's not <laughs> that you can see. Um, it's important to say that in the eventual lighthouse design, he didn't include the drawer, but in his, in his draft sketches of the, of, of the Glasgow Herald building, he, he did use this as a direct, um, piece of inspiration. Um, this is a fantastic one that my dad's noticed. Um, and uh, this is obviously his most famous building, the Glasgow School of Art. Um, and um, what we have here is, if you look at the top, um, running along the top here, we have this shaded area, which was just not something that you did in Scotland, uh, in Britain. Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a common thing. But Macintosh um, saw this. Um, the uh, the image on the left um, is is from it, it's basically from from Florence, um, and it's one of the buildings that Macintosh drew. Um, the Galliano da Miano, <laughs> useless. I do apologise, um, but you can see there that he's taken this. And he's directly applied it. Now, one of one of my dad's um, um, views on this was that he felt that maybe um, so. Obviously, this kind of thing applied in Italy um, uh, would would be 
uh, would relate to offering shade. Um, and obviously in Glasgow, it's probably better for uh, offering a shelter from the rain. But um, another part is that, you know, if Macintosh is including these details that he's seen in Florence uh, in the art school, he's almost saying, you know, we, you know, he's almost putting almost a, a, an artistic burden on the people that do the artwork in that building. You know, we're, we're taking influence from the best places, and you guys are going to be the best. And obviously, Glasgow School of Art was the best. So, um, uh, the last bit I'm going to do before we go into questions is to just um, guide you through some of the process of putting together a book like this. Um, and this was um, this, you know, this. This kind of process, is, it does take a while, especially when there's so many different assets that need to be fed into the production of a book. Um, so I'll take you through these. Now, um, my dad had, my, my dad had uh, written his book and was looking for a publisher some years ago. It was probably, I can't remember how many years ago now. Um, but, um, you know, we started to look for a publisher and I was kind of giving him a hand with that because I've got a bit of a background in it. Um, and um, I was away um, in Culloden of all places. Um, uh, and it was, it was an event for the Cultural Enterprise Office and we, I was doing a wee talk there. And, uh, and I bumped into this really nice chap um, uh, called Mr. Stenlake, uh, who was also doing a talk. Um, and he, he said at the time, you know, he was, he was talking about publishing uh, and um, he said uh, after his sort of chat, he said, you know, if anyone in the audience uh, is, has a book or would be interested uh, in getting in touch with me, then please do. And I think it was a few months later, I thought, you know, it's worth a stab, let's get in touch with them. Uh, and actually, it, it worked out really, really well because um, Stenlake have well, the type of company they are um, really worked well with this book. Um, I've included a wee battle of Claude and Picture there because books are a battle. You know, they, they take a long time to produce. The, the, level, the amount of assets you have to gather, the amount of permissions you need, all of that takes time. Um, a few interesting things here. Um, obviously, I, I said um, not so long ago about my dad um, with my mum helping him um, going around Italy and asset gathering, you know, identifying, taking photos, finding that lost street that has that Macintosh thing, you know, the thing that Macintosh drew along the end of it, an amazing voyage of discovery. And towards the end of the process, um, um, my dad was a wee bit, a wee bit poorly and, uh, and, and he was, I was really delighted to be able to help him gather some of the assets that he didn't have. Um, now there's a picture of the Nike store here. Um, uh, now this, um, uh, I have to look up the name of it again. Um, this is an example of the kind of fun thing that we got involved in. So for example, um, this back in Macintosh's day was the Wiley Hill department store. That was in 1889. And um, obviously I don't know anything about this kind of thing, but my dad said, could you go into the Nike store and uh, take some photographs? Um, of, um, it was a, a particular detail on a pillar. And this is it. These are throughout the whole of the Nike store. And if you, if you go in and you look up, you, you'll see them. And these are designed by Charles Rennie McIntosh, these here. It was one of the first things he designed that actually got produced. And um, it was lovely to be able to go into the store, um, get, get approached by someone saying, what are you doing? You try to take photos and then get into a discussion with them. And they were really delighted to find out that, you know, oh, wow, we, we, we had no idea that we had Macintosh all over this building. Um, another really interesting thing um, that, that my dad asked me to do um, was that he had managed to get in touch with um, one of Macintosh's relatives um, now, um, I'm not going to disclose the location or anything like that, <laughs> um, uh, but this, this lady, um, she, she's um, a descendant of Macintosh, and she has some of his original artwork um, still in her, hanging in her living room. Um, and it, as far as we knew, it had never been photographed before, it never been included in a book before. And, and I got to travel 
to see this lady and take photos. And it was a very strange uh, experience, you know, going in, taking these things that were original artworks off the wall, um, photographing them in the living room uh, and putting them back up. Um, and these images are also um, in the book. Um, uh, and the final part of the jigsaw, I think, for this book um, is the amazing contemporary images. And we've entirely got uh, Mr. Richard Stenlake and Stenlake Publishing to thank for this because um, you, you may have, um, maybe if you wander into Glasgow Museum shops and places like that, you'll see um, there's lots of um, often Scottish or, um, or English town sort of related books. And they're often called things like, you know, bygone Bishop Briggs, um, you know, old Cathcart, and there's all these fantastic uh, old images in them. And they're generally picture books of old photographs, postcards, things like that. And then um, uh, Richard said to us, he said, you know, I've got all these incredible old um, contemporary images, postcards um, from around Italy that, that are completely contemporary to when Macintosh was there. And so we got to almost dig into this wonderful treasure trove of images that haven't been really you know, shown before so that you as a reader can go through the book and get a real sense of what Macintosh saw. Um, and one of the things that I love about, about this element of it and that my dad loves is that there's all these fantastic characters that you see, you know, um, Stuart said earlier on, he said, is that Charlie Chaplin in that picture? You know, there's all these, all these great little uh, images uh, and people. You know, again, um, this is another one where you can see some sort of, very happy Italians uh, on their horse and cart um, and some fantastic ruins in the background. Um, so there you go. Um, and that really helped pull it all together. Um, now, the last thing I'll say in this part is just about where to get the book. We obviously, everyone's going through this, sorry, motorbike just went past the thing. Um, everyone's uh, obviously going through this sort of difficult time at the moment. And that's no different um, for bookshops, for you know places where you would normally um, source this kind of book. Um, so the, there's two places I'm going to sort of direct you towards. Uh, the first is uh, stenlake.co.uk. Um, and there you'll see the full range of Stenlake's books, obviously including the book behind me. Um, and also, obviously, waterstones.com. Um, what Richard was saying the other day was that the, um, if for the quickest order, you're probably best to go to Stenlake um, because, uh, but all, if you're willing to wait a wee bit longer, um, you can order it through waterstones.com as well. Um, so that's, that's me done for this part. So I'll hand back to Stuart. Thanks, Ashley. That was really good. Um, I know that. Um, it's not your usual um, process of doing doing all these these things. Uh, Aileen's actually joined. She's in the meeting, by the way, Ashley, um, who's the person you were talking about. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> what I'm going to do is this is a touches of Blue Peter. Now we've uh, prepared quite a few questions that I've uh, gone through and asked George, and uh, Ashley's going to respond on quite a number of these questions. So hopefully I'll tie in some of the things. It's things that possibly interest me in the book. I, I really enjoyed the book and I would thoroughly recommend the book. It's um, it's a really good read and it's, a, again, it's a, we don't have an opportunity to, apart from the latter uh, letters from Charles to Margaret, there's big gaps that we don't uh, get to really know the man. And it's quite interesting, this young 22 year old traveling through Italy, uh, for the first time abroad was uh, quite a revelation. So really one of the, the first questions I'm, I'm going to put, and he was a young man, he was in a strange land, what an adventure for him. So I think George has responded to that, if you want to do that, Ashley. Yeah, um, so each of these answers is, my, my dad has answered each of these. So I'll, I'm gonna read out my dad's responses so that it's in his words, okay? So my dad says, um, the prospect of traveling in Italy, Italy would not have been unfamiliar to him, as he would probably have discussed it with various friends and colleagues who had recently made trips. One was the young architect, George McKenzie, uh, and also his boss, John Kepi. Thanks, Ashley. The previous winner of the scholarship, William James Anderson's Italian studies and lectures clearly informed Macintosh's journey, along with the works of Ruskin. 
Yeah, and my dad says, um, William James Anderson had published a book, um, Architectural Studies in Italy in 1890. And there is a drawing of a piece of ornament by Macintosh, which was clearly copied from it in a sketchbook, um, which precedes the tour. There are Italian sketches by Macintosh, which indicate that he was informed by Anderson's work and probably consulted him before making the journey, such as drawings um, both Macintosh and, and Anderson made of a chimney piece in the Doge's palace in Venice and an obscure window in a Roman palace. It is known that Macintosh had an interest in Ruskin. He owned a copy of The Seven Lamps of Architecture and wrote a lecture on him. He doesn't mention him in his diary, but my dad is quoted from Rus Ruskin's um, copious writings on Italy, mainly to put Macintosh's comments in his contemporary context. Great. Apart from his early lectures, which I mentioned here, his letters to Margaret while in Port Vondres, his trip to Italy is perhaps the most documented section of his career. It certainly gives a great and rare insight into the man himself. It was an amazing adventure and a great opportunity for a 22 year old. Can you maybe put this into context and give an insight into how Macintosh prepared for the trip? Well, um, he said, my dad says, uh, as, as I hope I've already indicated, an Italian tour was still seen as a great educational source for young architects. Macintosh had studied historical architecture from classicism to Renaissance at Glasgow School of Art and would probably have attended lectures by Glasgow architects, including Anderson shortly before his trip. Unlike so many others, he chose to approach Italy via a sea voyage to Naples rather than traveling over the Alps. He gave his reason for doing this, that it set him up splendidly for the hard work that lay before him. He spent a week in London before embarking at Tilbury probably to make arrangements. Macintosh liked to record how much things cost in his diary, but he never mentions the rail fares. This is probably because he bought a circular ticket in advance. These were available at a discount from Thomas Cook's. He also mentions visits to the bank in Naples and Rome, and these could have been those run by Cook's. Um, it also, it's also probable that he booked a few hotels in advance his first at Naples and another at Rome, as he doesn't mention the prices in his diary and he generally does for most hotels. He also had the use of um, the Bedecker guides and he quotes verbatim from one in his 1892 lecture. Uh, the Bedecker was in, was, has excellent city maps and gives details of hotel, hotels and their costs. Is a portrait of an inspired artist who at the time times frank and at times rebellious. The diary also throws some light on his personality. I love his terse comments and reviews of the people in the buildings. Yeah, uh, my dad says there are many examples of this. He would refer to the interior of Palermo Cathedral as a most miserable classic. Um, he was disparaging about Moderno's front of St. Peter's and compared the, inter the interior um, Unfavorable, unfavorably to that of Monreal Cathedral in Sicily. He found nothing of interest in Mantua, despite its possessing the highly regarded church of Sant Andrea, a masterpiece by Alberti. And um, he described the same architect's bell tower on Ferrara Cathedral as about as ugly as they can make them. <laughs> and it's M, he says. Um, uh, his biased views on Italians in general were initially formed by his experiences in Naples, which, be, which began when he disembarked and had his tobacco confiscated by the customs officials because he re refused to pay the duty. I'm just going to share an image because uh, it's one that I... Um, uh, let's see if I can get that. Um, yeah, it's... Um, Naples, he viewed Naples as, as best seen from a distance. The poverty, the idleness appalled him. Beggarly Italians, he wrote, loafing black guards. Yet he and his friends from the ship visited the Galleria Umberto I, which had recently been opened. And I assume he, he must have known in advance of this beautiful example of 19th century architects. He actually describes it as, it's the most magnificent building, really good architecture. Yeah, and I, I think that's the I think that's the one that 
Uh, I, you know, that I saw in the news not so long ago. It's a it's a stunning building. Yeah, don't disagree with them. <laughs> yeah, I think you had said. I think what you went. Yeah, what uh, George said on the back of that. Yeah, because he didn't really know in advance. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, just looking at that response from my dad. So yeah, so he didn't know about it. So yeah. The same. He was greatly delighted by Palermo throughout the tour. He was overwhelmed by the sumptuousness of the ornament, in particular the mosaic decoration of the 12th century Capella Palatina of Palermo's royal palace, a jewel of Norman Saracenic Sar uh, Saracenic art. He was simply struck dumb with astonishment. Here is something I'd never seen, never even dreamt of. The interior is one of massive mosaics on gold, on gold ground. Yeah, um, my dad says he was highly impressed by Norman, I'm going to try it now, Saracenic art. <laughs> uh, his, his response to Monreal Cathedral was similar. Church, so he says, church not much outside, but golly, what an interior. Uh, he also admired, admired the, the Byzantine time mosaics he encountered at Ravenna and St. Mark's in Venice. His trip, his trip back and forward from Naples to Sicily paints a very enlightening picture. I think you'd mentioned a little bit before, but I think George adds to it in his response there. Yeah, yeah. My dad said, uh, before on his journey to the harbour in Naples, he record, records being fleeced on every hand by these beggarly Italians. His bad mood continued on the voyage. Um, the ship, to his consternation, was full of Italians. Um, dinner was the most disgraceful repast, he said, um, which most passengers, he says, were unable to eat, and only two remained at table, and they, underlined in his diary, were Italians. Uh, and <laughs> most people are unable to eat anything. Uh, he also unleashed his anger at the ship, which rolled and tossed in the most reckless manner. Although it wasn't actually um, rough, but the boat was about as bad as could be, just like a Clyde tugboat. And within two hours, he was in company with most of the passengers uh, as sick as a dog. So he was very ill. Um, his return voyage must have been much easier, but he wasted no time in going to the station in Naples and boarding the first train to Rome. And I think the interesting thing that uh, I can't remember if I put it in or missed earlier on, is that the ship that he refers to as being like a Clyde tugboat, just, just like the other boat that arrived on was also built on the Clyde, because everything used to be built on the Clyde. <laughs> so. Yeah, he mentions in his lecture, I show, I show various palaces from Rome, which are all more or less interesting according to taste. I may add that the road from the capital to Colosseum taking the Romanum and the Campo of Asin, bears a very striking resemblance to some parts of the east end of Glasgow, assuming about two thirds of the population to be dead of cholera. The level of filth and grime seems to have had a profound effect. His observation of Italian life had a lasting impact. Yeah, my dad says he was also angry when he was unable to enter several churches in Naples because they had strange opening hours. And he felt he had been defrauded when um, the Vatican museums closed at 3 p.m. Orvieta is a town that I know really well, and, and I've visited it on, on numerous occasions. And like me, his main focus was on the beautiful cathedral. He had a lot of praise for this masterpiece of Italian Gothic, as you can see by the number of sketches and watercolours. Despite this, he gave some harsh comments about the town itself, characterised by idleness, dirt and misery. Much has changed since then. Um, yeah, he says, my dad says, uh, among his cathedral drawings are two watercolours of ornament from the West Front, not dissimilar from the mosaic work he admired in Palermo. You can still stay at the Aquila Bianca, the hotel which Macintosh stayed at. I'm going to have to make a, a point to try and visit that next time. Definitely. <laughs> Macintosh says more about Siena Cathedral than any other building he didn't go he didn't go and see the buildings he was advised to. He seems to have taken a, an ambivalent view of Florence, as he can, outlines in a letter to Fran Ubre on a return visit in 1925. I found Florence just as artificial in a stupid way as I did 25 years ago when I was a small lad. He's certainly thinking for himself. He's following exactly what he is interested in rather than what he's told to study. Yeah, um, my dad says he, he described the famous bell tower 
of the Palazzo Vecchio as a bad tower, um, a crib from Siena, and he was very disappointed with Florence Cathedral. I I sometimes find when you read something in a book and you see it somewhere later, I've seen some that couldn't relate back to the, he made comments that Florence was like a, 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 a kind of wedding cake, Christmas cake, it was all ornamentation, you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, interesting while in Siena, he bumps into two architects, James Paxton and Robin Dodds. Paxton, like Macintosh, served his apprenticeship at John Hutchison's office in Glasgow. This cannot be a coincidence. They must have known each other at strips. So my dad says that you're probably right on that one. Um, though in his diary, he makes it sound accidental. He travelled with Paxton and Dodds for much of the rest of his journey as far as Verona. Uh, in, in sort of Milan, again, it's going back to one might have expected that he would have praised the arcade, the Gallery Vittoria, Emmanuel II, the first such structure to be erected in Italy, and a forerunner of the one he had admired in Naples. But compared with the latter, he found it much inferior. Well, my dad simply says that, obviously, he probably looked for it, but unfortunately, Macintosh doesn't tell us why. <laughs> Just uh... One building that really caught, this will be interesting for my Italian like yourself, one building that really caught his eye was the design and treatment of one of Paul de Pizzola's private apartment. This was the Studiola de Dantesco, designed by the Milanese art artist, craftsman Giuseppe Bernini and Luigi Scrosati. Paul de Pizzoli had it structured in the style of a 14th century between 1854 and 1856 to display some of his medieval artifacts and to celebrate Italy's great poet and patriot Dante Allegri. Despite its mid-century date and treatment of the walls, particularly the plant-based ornamentation and gilded and painted gesso and ceramic by Scrisati, looks forward to Art Nouveau. This must have been a revelation for Macintosh with his interest in plant form, its use of different materials and its display of craftsmanship. Yeah, um, my dad says that this was a real discovery for him. Um, Macintosh made two uncaptioned drawings of the ornament and only mentioned that he visit, visited the Pallodi Pizzoli Museum with no further comments. The room was damaged by Allied bombing in 1944, but has been beautifully restored. One wonders if this excited his future interest in, in gesso um, as a decorative art medium. And I should add, the book has some really lovely images that my dad took of that restoration and yeah. also the, his original illustration by the side of it. Following the letter from John Shields, the secretary of the Thompson trustees, Macintosh must have been deeply disappointed that the committee were not going to release the remaining £30 of the prize money. Yeah, um, uh, so my dad says this, this made him change the plans for his tour. Um, he had hoped to travel to Genoa and then take a ship to France, where he would probably have studied the country's architecture. Um, I think it's worth adding, now, although I, I said earlier on in the presentation that I wasn't going to tell you what happened, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. He, he tried to sort of barter with them um, and he tried to get responses um, you know, on whether he could um, stay for the longer period uh, for the originally intended nine months and essentially have the money sent over. Uh, but uh, because he wasn't really, he didn't seem too keen on sending his actual, uh, all his artwork, uh, he didn't really trust the Italian Postal Service. And the answer unfortunately came back no, so he wasn't able to, you know, stay for the longer term, which is a shame. He must have been very upset, I'd imagine. Yeah, so I follow on and whatever his feelings, he was still determined to make the best use of the time left in it, him in Italy. The Cartosa would be the subject in Pavia, would be the subject of more drawings than any other building he had visited in the whole tour. 28 sketches, many of them finished in watercolour, all except one, a drawing of the interior of the dome in its church, being studies of decorative details. Do you think not receiving the remaining money made him focus more on the job in hand? I mean, my, my dad says that he thinks that's entirely possible. Um, he must have uh, he must have spent several days at the Cartosa, which at the time was open as a museum um, and was adjacent so right across from his actual hotel. And again, you did touch on the influence of the tour. The tour shows Macintosh as a young architect with a mind of his own. 
ignoring the strict st stipulations of the respected grant body, which made this trip possible, instead pursuing his desire to learn more about Renaissance architecture. And I did put a note that said if the trustees had been unhappy to award the prize, they had however one concern, they minuted that the second clause of the trust should be strictly adhered to in its future, namely that the studentship or prizes shall be awarded for the furtherance of the study of ancient classic architecture as practiced prior to the third century of the Christian era and with special reference to the principles illustrated in the works of the late Alexander Thompson. Macintosh had, had obviously flouted this rule, but perhaps some guilt attached to it, the trustees themselves who had previously given permission to the prize winner William James Anderson to concentrate on 16th century Renaissance architecture. Yeah, my, my dad says Macintosh definitely uh, flouted the rule, um, but his interest was wider than Renaissance architecture, um, including everything up to Renaissance, um, although he showed little interest in Baroque. Um, incidentally, most of his drawings are of architectural details and ornament, um, and a good number of those are from museums. Um, very few are of complete buildings. Over the next couple of years following his tour, the sketchbook would become a source of his own architectural designs. We'd, we'd like to get your thoughts on this. I know you've made some bits and pieces of comments, but I think George highlighted some bits as well. Yeah, yeah um, he's, my, my dad says that basically um, he, he thinks that Macintosh seemed to be uh, getting Italy out of his system and celebrating the knowledge that he had gained on the tour. Um, besides which his Italianate schemes accorded well with the contemporary historicist approach to architecture. His gold medal prize awarded by the Department of Science and Art in 1892, when he was still a student at Glasgow School of Art, is an amalgam of sources from Como and Milan cathedrals and the Cartoso de Pavia, um, topped off with Flemish gables. His competition design for Kelvin Grove contains many Italian Renaissance features, including statues based on Michelangelo and a staircase turret, which is a direct crib from the apse of a church in Como. What I was going to say also to let people know is this is, I thought I'd mentioned this was our first online talk and I hope everybody's enjoyed it. And um, um, it, it's nice to have so many people attending these, which you wouldn't normally be able to do even at Macintosh Queen's Cross. Uh, but we have a, another one on uh, Monday the 15th of February, and we're delighted that Robin Calvert will join us to discuss the unique working relationship of Charles Ray Macintosh and his wife and artistic partner, Margaret MacDonald. Further details and booking information are now available on our website, and we've already started to have two bookings for that as well. So. Uh, there will be one in, uh, we're trying to have one every month. There will be a, a follow up one in, um, in March as well. So we've got a number scattered out. We've got quite an interesting program uh, that will be coming up. We've also got Lachlan Gowdy later in the year talking about uh, Scot Scottish art and such. So, and uh, I'm hoping to get um, uh, a, a talk on uh, Glee Place as well. So there's, it's quite varied. Was there any more? In more comments, just some people saying very interesting. Thank you. Any general comments? Or? I was going to say just if there are any um, in-depth questions, I mean, Stuart, would it be an idea for them to be sent to you and then we can forward them on to my dad? Yeah, I think there have been nice comments coming in. People seem to have enjoyed it. And um, yeah. it's. Yeah. Uh, I think you'll all enjoy the book as well, which um, I'll do a plug for the book. Um, I kind of good. Yeah. I enjoyed reading it and it's adds to the, it's another great addition to Macintosh collection of books, it, it kind of fills another area and it links well. Yeah. And I hope uh, George is okay and get it gets better, so. Uh. Yes, yes, yeah. Obviously, it's, it, it would have been, um, the, you know, if, if my dad could have been here tonight, he would have been able to really bring this to life. And I'm, I'm all, we, all I've been trying to do is sort of do, do the best I could with um, about, about 0.01% of his actual knowledge. So <laughs> I know I did. I was chatting earlier to <laughs> Dallison because we did two uh, evenings at uh, we did Macintosh. We did Italian food based on Macintosh's uh, tour, and we, and George stepped in and did little little cameos of of the diary <laughs> and elements there, and we did dishes from the specific areas that Macintosh travelled through. So it's nice to link those two. 
Yep, yep. So, so yeah, buy the book and go on the tour of Italy when we're allowed out of our houses. That's the that's the yeah. general. Uh, and I think that's the that'll be one of the first things. I when I next go on holiday, I think it will be to Italy, and it'll be nice to have that as a companion, mm -hmm. the wee guide. So, yeah. I've been to um, or Rome, Florence, and Orvieta of the three. So, uh, but Orvieta is one of the places because not is no, and the wine's nice as well from there. So good, good wine. Always good. Always good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much, Ashley, for contributing. And I know that it wasn't a straightforward thing for you, but it was really good. I think it, um, I enjoyed it. So, and I think it, it paints a really good picture as well. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks to everyone, and thanks for the lovely messages. I can see them all popping up. That's cheered me up. So, um, all the best, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward right. to seeing you next uh, next month for the talk by Robin Calvert. So, thank you very oh, much. Oh, I'll join in. Yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll get my ticket. Okay. okay. Right. All the best, everyone. Bye, bye. then. Thanks bye. a lot. Bye. 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 bye.